Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to Nine Lives podcast with me, your host, Cassia. Season two, episode 12, halfway through season two, which is really crazy. I can't believe it. It's been such an amazing season and we've touched on so many different uh, tools and so much information about self-help, self-betterment, all of those good things, running, lifting, mental health, shadow work. We've, we've covered it all. But today, I think this is going to be the most important episode of the season yet. Um, it's one that I've been working on for a little while and it's something I'm really, really passionate about. And it's something I think you need to build before you can attempt anything that we've talked about. Today, we're going to be talking all about being brave, what being brave means, how to be brave, how to have courage, how to build the habit of having courage because it is a habit like anything else in life it's something we can learn so we're going to dive into that today a uh, little life update for me um, I keep forgetting to do these at the beginning of the podcast but um, I'm in my taper now for Paris Paris Marathon is just a little over a week away oh my goodness um, very very excited I am very thankful to be to be done with that training block I have come to the conclusion that I think I'm not sure I'll do many marathons after this one. I think um, I really love trail running and I really love trail ultras, but something about speed work and training for marathons is so fatiguing and so hard on your body and mind. And I love the challenge and I love the adventure of it all, but I've, you know, gets to a point where I'm so inflamed and I'm so stressed and I'm so tired that I'm kind of like, what am I doing this for? Um, I mean, I know what I'm doing it for. I'm doing it because I want to prove to myself that I can and that I can do it faster. And, you know, Paris is, it's going to be beautiful. And, um, it means a lot to me, this specific race, um, to do it in France. And so it'll be great, but I, uh, yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to, after the race, um, slowing down, focusing on my mental health, focusing on low intensity exercise and just getting my lifestyle back. And anyone who's in a race block will tell you similar similar things like, I just really miss sitting in a coffee shop and watching the world go by indulging in other hobbies you know when you have so many miles to run a week and so many different sessions with speed work and you're thinking about fueling nutrition recovery stretching like all of this like it becomes so all-consuming and while it's beautiful to be so in something because the training block really that is the marathon you know the race is just the wonderful thing at the end that you do and you get the medal but I think um uh, yeah I'm just really I'm looking forward to chilling out um, there's something in me, especially since turning 30, it's this weird, like, I really want to slow down. And I've never felt like that before, like in anything in my life. It's always been like, go, go, go. Like whether it's been like a partying or running or building a business or building a podcast, like I've always been just like so on it. And there's just this, I can feel it in my bones and my soul that it's time to slow down. And I feel I feel so happy that I've come to that conclusion. And I often sometimes think I'm like, you know, why am I doing all of this? Does it make me happy? Am I trying to prove something? Like I've proved it. <laughs> There's nothing more to prove. Now it's time for me to reap, you know, reap the harvest of what I've sowed and have a really lovely <laughs> chilled life. Like, I, I mean, I say that and I've signed up for a hundred kilometer ultramarathon running London to Brighton in May. So, you know, look, <laughs> there'll always be one or the other with me and a bit of give and take, but that's how I've been feeling. Tonight, after this, I'm I'm going to my first ever run club with Gymshark. We're taking over the Gymshark store, me and the 444 coaches, which is going to be amazing. I'm so excited and I'm so nervous. I spent a little bit longer getting ready today, so I feel quite pretty. I've done my makeup properly, which I haven't done since starting this training block. So it's nice to feel clean and fresh. And I'm really looking forward to to doing that, um, doing some public speaking, which, uh, but as the topic of this podcast is all about, then it's perfect. I'm just going to be brave and I'm going to do it. So being brave is something I'm very passionate about, 
being brave changed my life. And I don't see it spoken about enough, especially in in fitness and in wellness. When I think of the word brave, I muster up images of great roaring lions, knights on horseback, swinging swords and racing into battle. I think of facing down enemies. I think of our ancestors locked in battle. I think of marathons and ultras, of strong men and women. But brave can also be small. Brave can be picking up the phone and calling the doctor. Brave can be admitting you are struggling. Brave can be opening the door after a low episode and going outside. Brave is brushing your teeth. Brave is choosing to live when you don't feel like it. In tiny ways, we are all being brave every single day. I wear my bravery like a badge of honour now, and I I relish jumping into adventures that are coined not for the faint of heart. That's one of my favourite expressions now, Um, and actually something my mum described my my life to one of her friends. She said, oh, Cassia gets up to it's not for the faint of heart, and I just thought, gosh, isn't that such a... It literally gives me goosebumps because for so long I felt so faint of heart, and to know that people look at me as brave and adventurous is just wonderful. Um, because at one point I, you know, I was faint of heart and I said no to everything, every outing with friends, every summer day, every trip away, every experience, I always said no. And I was too scared. I was too terrified of failure, too terrified to be seen. Bravery means a lot to me. And I hope today to give you the tools to become brave too. So in the words of the great Joan of Arc... I am not afraid I was born to do this. So when we think of being brave and what it means to be brave, I think it's a lot about harnessing courage, building confidence and working through situations that are outside of your comfort zone. Bravery is a positive way of thinking that motivates someone into action regardless of danger, risk or challenge. I will preface this with please never engage in activities that are going to be bad for your physical or mental health. I'm just talking more in a general sense, things that are to do with your wellness and some things in this modern world we can find quite hard to do and quite intimidating. So Unlike courage, a deliberate mustering of determination in the face of distressing circumstances, bravery tends to be part of someone's general mindset. If you're brave, you usually approach multiple aspects of life in a bold way. It's okay if you don't consider yourself brave yet. Maybe by the end of this podcast, you'll feel a bit braver. But bravery is something that can be built and learning how to be brave can help you achieve personal growth in other areas like self-confidence. And today I wanted to run through nine tips or nine ways you can grow and be brave as a person. Um, The reference and some information for these is taken from psychcentral.com, which is an amazing website. They really um, simplify a lot of psychology. So if you're ever curious about any kind of um, papers or anything that feel a little too complicated, then Psych Central is a really good website to visit. So number one is building optimism. So you are your thoughts. We've been through this quite a few times. But if I think about how I was previously to how I was now, the main difference is the way that I speak to myself and how much I'm in tune with what's really going on in my subconscious mind. There is a constant chatter and conversation happening within your own head. And unless you are quick enough to catch it, those thoughts can spiral so quickly into a negative place. Then you begin telling yourself a narrative or a story about yourself or your life or your abilities that is negative. You wouldn't believe if you said, okay, today I'm going to catch, I'm going to watch my thoughts. I'm going to watch the thinker. So I Every time I think something negative about myself or a situation or someone else or my, you know, abilities to do something, I'm going to catch it and I'm going to be like, whoa, that's not, I shouldn't be speaking to myself like that. I would never talk to a friend like that. Why would I speak to myself in this way? So optimism is a proactive, positive way of thinking. It's the sense that the journey will end successfully, even when the road to get there is rocky. Optimism is hard. 
I went from a really pessimistic person to I am like infectiously optimistic now. Like it's pretty hard to find me not sunny side up. Um, when mistakes happen or challenges happen, I really, really relish them. I think that it's such a fun way to kind of challenge yourself or dive into something in life. And I always try to keep optimism as much as I can. Obviously, when we're struggling with our mental health, it's easier said than done, right? But you can change your mindset to be more of an optimistic person. And I think these kind of people, you can always tell who they are because they have a slight like infectious light around them. I know that the people in my life who I work with and look up to have this like optimism that rolls off them like a kind of glow and they bring people into their um, worlds with it. And then they're infectiously sort of being like, yes, let's do this. Let's do that. You can do it. You can do it. And those are the sort of people you want to surround yourself with. But more importantly, that's the sort of person that you can become. So building optimism may help you to build courage, which is a stepping stone to bravery. Uh, when you assume things will turn out fine, for example, you may be less hesitant to engage in action. I've touched on this a few times when it comes to my running journey or lifting journey. Um, the whole embody it until you become it thing. Um, Sometimes you do just have to say, it'll be fine. There are so many things in my life where I have no idea how I've pulled it off or why it's happening. Like tonight, for example, terrified. It'll be fine though. It'll be fine. Having that kind of attitude where you are just being optimistic, even in the face of like danger or terror or doing something scary can trick your brain into thinking, that you've got it and you're capable and you can be brave and you can do it. And the more you repeat that pattern, the more capable you will become. The, the amount of races or runs or deadlifts that I have done that have literally just been because I've said to myself, it'll be fine. And it is fine. You know, there is so much power in positive thinking. And of course, sometimes it's hard, it's hard I know, um, but these are exercises you can do in your own mind, even if it is just like I say, catching those negative thoughts and even doing something like writing them down when they appear in your mind, you'd be, you'd be so surprised at how nasty we can be to ourselves and how much we can really talk ourselves out of doing things. And when you write them down or you say them out loud, it can be quite shocking, like I catch myself all the time. I have such bad imposter syndrome, especially over the last few years. And like, I caught myself last night <laughs> just having this thought in my brain, like no one's going to turn up to this event and you're going to stumble over your words. It's going to be really embarrassing. And I literally, I had to be like, no, you don't make that the narrative. It will be fine. Everything will turn out fine because there's a future version of you who will know what to do and will work it out as you've always done in your life you know again and again and again we face adversity and we get through it and we become stronger and you have to trust that the future version of yourself will also be able to do the same thing so building optimism some tools would be gratitude journaling I mean this is a huge thing gratitude is one of the main drivers of optimism and positivity and gratitude doesn't have to be for huge things it can be for the smallest things like my favorite moment in my day is always the first cup of tea in the morning really early with my dog on my sofa I am so grateful for that moment of stillness I will always be grateful for that moment of stillness um and I think just grounding yourself in those sorts of things can really foster a sense of optimism in your life. Praising yourself for successes. We touched on this last week a little bit, pausing to really tell yourself, you've done something really cool. That was a really, really successful thing. And it can be as small as completing a habit for three days in a row or leaving the house when you don't feel like it, just praising yourself. We get so little positive reinforcement from the world around us nowadays because people are so competitive and there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of nasty energy out there for people like me and you. I'm sure if you're listening, you're also like quite a light, empathic person. It can be really draining and really tiring. And sometimes you have to be your own champion and give yourself that encouragement. So Praising yourself for successes is definitely a way to foster optimism. So pre-planning several pathways to achieve your goals. This is a big one. And I think 
lots of people fail to realize that having a plan, you know, it can change everything. Even if, like, there are so many things that I sometimes go into and I have no idea what I'm doing, but I kind of fake it till I make it. You would be so surprised at how like much information there is now out there for you to be able to at least have a little bit of a plan going into something. And a lot of it is just about speaking positively uh, to yourself about the thing that you're going to do and making a little bit of a plan, you know, pre-planning pathways towards your goals makes it so much easier. It also means that when you look back, you can have checkpoints along the way and look at what you've achieved so far on the way to that ultimate goal. It's a really, really beautiful way of building optimism and being brave. Visualization, huge part of my journey, big part of what work that I've done with clients as well, visualizing the best outcome possible. I have had to really, really train my mind to stop thinking about the worst case scenario. I used to be such a disaster thinker, like everything was catastrophic and it would always be the worst thing would always happen in my brain. I'd even, I used to make up negative scenarios and hurt myself with them. That's how far out of control my mind was. Like I literally would be okay, I'm embarking on this new endeavor, wonderful. I would then start to imagine all of the things that can go wrong and start catastrophizing and visualizing the worst possible outcome. And then I wouldn't do the thing that I had promised myself I would do. So it's harder to be brave when you think what you're going to do is going to fail. But if you just go into it with a little bit of visual visualization, give yourself permission to dream in a really big way and for it to be ludicrous. Like, I, you know, I have big dreams for my life that are ridiculous, but I let myself visualize them and I let myself feel how that's going to feel when I get there. And it helps me to be brave and it helps me to do the things that I don't want to do because I know that they're going to add up into that future that I want. Okay. Number two would be finding courage. I like to always think of the expression, mustering up the courage. Courage is one of my favorite words. For me, the most courageous thing that I ever did was opening up about my secret eating and binging and alcohol misuse um, and actually tell my friends and family that I was struggling. Because there's so much shame around those topics and it can be quite embarrassing for people, it's really, really hard to open up. But that courageous act changed the course of my life forever. Admitting it to myself and admitting it to other people meant that then I was able to begin to heal. Approaching life with optimism may help you find courage, but optimism isn't necessary to be courageous. Courage is a conscious action. It's what you have when you motivate yourself forward when risk or negative emotions are encouraging you to stay put. So this is like... A internal battle, right? To have courage, to take courage and do the thing anyway. This is another really good method that I use, which is the 321 method. I've done this so many times with difficult emails, difficult phone calls, difficult conversations, text messages, or opening the door to go for a run when it's raining, you name it. I just always in my head say, three, two, one, go, three, two, one, send, <laughs> three, two, one, open the door and fling yourself out. Sometimes you have to really muster yourself into that courageous action and ling yourself into it. Really and truly, the most beautiful parts of life do exist on the other side of the courageous act. And courage is for everybody. All of us can learn to be courageous and brave in so many different ways. But courage can be a step toward an overall mindset of bravery, but you don't have to jump right into heroic level deeds to practice it. You can practice finding courage during small moments. If you've been avoiding a doctor's visit, for example, due to fear of hearing bad news, courage is taking the step to make that first appointment. Personal courage is individual based on your thoughts, feelings and beliefs. So I have a couple mates, Lucy and Savannah at the moment, who are running from LA to Las Vegas, which is 500 and something kilometers. Okay. That's a crazy ultramarathon. They are so brave. They're running through the desert. It's, that is courage. Okay. I'm not brave enough for that yet. 
I just, I'm working my way up to those sort of events and to be around those sort of really athletic people. But that's their courage and that's their brave. My brave is going to Paris. Um, that's a big thing for me. My brave is doing this event tonight, getting over my fear of public speaking. There are so many different ways to be brave and it's okay if you're finding it difficult when you're looking at social media and you're seeing what other people are doing and you're feeling like your brave doesn't match up to theirs. But it's the same emotion and it's the same level of, you know, overcoming fear and saying, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to champion myself and I'm going to do it anyway. So never, ever compare your bravery to someone else's. Number three would be increasing confidence. Confidence is something that can only really come from within, not outside validation. Of course, validation helps and it's always good to have encouragement and to be surrounded by community and, and peers and coaches and whoever. That's so, so important. But real confidence and self-assuredness, it comes from inside it has to come from your core. Confidence is built in the act of keeping promises to yourself. The more you put off or flake out on, the less confident you will feel. So keep those promises to yourself. This is a big thing about bravery. I remember so many times, so many times, I used to promise myself I was going to do something. I was going to start a fitness journey. I was going to start a business. I was going to read a book. Like there was so many things that I would do. I make these promises to myself and then I would end up not doing them. And I'd break that promise and I'd flake out on myself. And that would have a knock on effect to my confidence. You would be so surprised at how little actions, just keeping, keep, you know, making a plan and following through affects your confidence positively. Like I remember the first time that I went out every day for seven days in a row on like a walk or a little jog thing in my local park. My confidence by Friday was just, I felt great. I was dancing around the kitchen because I'd, I'd finally kept a promise to myself. And that was just going to the local park. You know, that's not some huge heroic action. It's not a massive, you know, world changing event, but it changed my world forever. And I felt so brave and I felt so courageous. And I was building up that self-esteem and that confidence to feel self-assured and feel like I could really trust myself. And just like bravery is something that is built, trust is also built too. And with every action that you take, you can build that trust in yourself. But feeling assured in your capabilities is what it means to have confidence. When you're learning how to be brave, feeling confident means that you may be less likely to have doubts or fears that stop you from acting. Like bravery, confidence can be built. You may be able to improve your self-confidence by reframing inner statements from I can't to I can really simple one. Even if it feels ludicrous, like I said before, just say it anyway. I can. I can run on the moon. I can run on Jupiter. Setting small achievable goals. I mean, this whole podcast is about that, isn't it? <laughs> Doing tiny, tiny things one day at a time, one tiny action, one tiny goal at a time. You know, not setting out on an ultra marathon to begin with, but brushing your teeth, making your bed, all of those small little things, they, they build that self-confidence. Practicing self-affirmations. So even when you don't feel like it, being nice to yourself and telling yourself your positive affirmations. Sometimes I have a tricky one with affirmations. You know what? Like I, it's such a buzzword, isn't it? People are always saying like, oh, you know, these are my affirmations of the day. I am beautiful. I am brave. I am self-assured. I am wonderful. I'm capable of anything. And I think sometimes those can kind of roll off the tongue and feel a little bit inorganic and a little bit like you're not connected to them. Or a lot of these sort of like self-help things are, yeah, they just feel a little sugary sweet, you know? I think if you're going to do affirmations, make them realistic and personal to you. Um, like one of my favorite ones is, it's such a weird one. I don't even know how I came up with it, but it is, um, everything I touch turns to gold. And the other one is I am a juggernaut. Those are my two favorite. And I say them again and again in my brain. I say them a lot when I'm running. Um, and I, 
they they probably don't make sense to anyone else, but I just have this thing where if I'm starting to go into that self um, doubt and those inner statements are coming for me and they're kind of you know, gnawing on my heels behind me when I'm trying to do something positive, being like, you can't, you can't, you can't. I just always say like, everything I touch turns to gold. Everything I touch turns to gold. You know, it's such a lovely thing to keep saying. And it's one that I've found has really physically manifested through everything in my life. Everything I touch turns to gold. Um, another really uh, popular one is um, everything is always working out for me which is really lovely. I, I think that's such a lovely one because sometimes if you're spiraling into those thoughts, just breaking it, everything is always working out for me. You know, that's a really, really lovely one. So just make sure with the affirmations that they're personal to you and it's something that that gives you that fire, that sort of hook into it, you know, that isn't these sort of like copy and paste, girl boss, self help, you know, whatever. Um yeah, like me saying to myself, I am a juggernaut. That's so weird, but it, it conjures up images of huge machinery or big creatures like going, you know, it's so me and it feels so personal and it really helps me. So maybe today you could think a little bit about what those affirmations could sound like to you. You know, they can be as weird as you want, but if it makes your heart race and it makes you excited, then it's a good affirmation to have. So number four accumulating competence and knowledge, arming yourself with information. This is such a huge one to being brave. Obviously, we, we all know a little bit about my story of sort of being unable to, to learn and finding it really, really difficult to pay attention. Um, but this is directly linked to your cognitive function, learning, reading, growing. There is so much information out there. You can arm yourself with knowledge and be brave about the decisions you make because you feel more self-assured in the things that you know. And this can be anything at all. Like I always say, I know that I am into fitness, but this podcast and everything I talk about, you can relate it to anything in your life. If you're someone who has always wanted to illustrate a children's novel, let's say, being brave and doing the research into the market, doing loads of drawings, practicing, practicing, arming yourself with information is such a good way of grounding yourself in the bravery because you just feel like you have this army of information behind you. When it comes to building confidence and increasing your bravery levels across the board, skill expansion may help. The more you know, the more tools you have to navigate daily life and the more capable you feel in multiple areas. This is a really interesting one and I think I'd like to talk a little bit about books here. Because I have found in my life, and I don't know if you guys ever feel like this or if this is something you've come across, but there are <laughs> um, hundreds of self-help podcasts and hundreds of self-help books. And I think they're brilliant. Obviously, I have one. So, you know, who am I to talk? But I think if I could advise you on anything, it would be to read a little bit of classic literature, read a little bit of poetry um, read about, I don't know, mechanics, read about flower arranging, N give yourself knowledge of the world, you know, history, geography, art, uh, all of the classical tales of Nosferatu, it, you know, I feel well-rounded, well-educated and very self-assured because I do know I don't know everything about the world. Maybe I know a little bit more than I used to, but it makes me feel very good knowing that I have this information. And I think that a lot of people, what they miss when they really, all they're doing is absorbing constant self-help information. You know, we've got Atomic Habits, like all of these amazing resources, which are great. And they're so focused on living optimally, right? It's all about optimization, optimal morning routine, optimal evening routine put salt under your eyelids at night and it will do something to your brain like you know sometimes I think it's nice to take a step away from that and learn a little bit about the world and through that you can explore yourself too mm, there's a big buzz around obviously health and fitness at the moment and wellness 
And honestly, there's only so much you can get into it, I think, personally. I think there's so much more out there in the world. Coming from my background in film, especially, you know, um, for a long time, I, I lost the love of cinema and of literature. But that was a huge part of my life growing up as a lonely kid who didn't have many mates. I lost myself to film and literature and that was my little safe space. But now I'm back in that world again and I'm reading and I'm discovering things. And through that, I'm then using references to inspire my ultra marathons and you know it, it all ties into one and I think if you can feel like you're a well-read rounded and worldly person it can make you feel really confident and it definitely helps with your bravery especially if you're into fantasy novels and you like reading about battles and superheroes and comic books you know those things can definitely help because you can just pretend <laughs> that you're Batman, which is what I did for a year. So when I was getting into lifting, which probably makes no sense at all, but I did do that. A 2020 study found that improving knowledge and confidence significantly predicts positive improvements in confidence. This sense of overall self-efficiency allows you to take on the challenges of the day in their entirety, not just one or two moments that require courage. So number five is engaging in physical fitness. This is the biggest one. Well, I don't know if it's the biggest one, but it's certainly an important one. Feeling self-assured in your abilities to perform. Now, when you think about someone who's brave, you're probably imagining someone who's physically strong, right? Like I'm thinking about, I don't know, the Vikings. Let's say the Vikings. Oh, they were brave, weren't they? The Celts. Ancient people. Um running into battle with their huge muscles, <laughs> running across the sea. Um, having that self-assuredness in your physical capabilities and grounding yourself in your physical strength or physical fitness is huge for bravery and confidence. I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but feeling capable isn't just about knowledge. Feeling physically able to meet your personal needs can be an important part of bravery. Physical fitness is empowering. It can provide peace of mind that you have strength in times when you need it to be physically strong. It can also help you be more confident in your ability to achieve challenging goals and be independent. Independence is something I've thought about a lot recently as well when it comes to my fitness journey. Someone asked me the other day, like, what do you what was the question? It was like, what do you think about when you run or, or how do you stay running when you're running? Like what motivates you? And a big part of why I love long distance running so much and fitness so much is because it gives me and it grants me my independence as a human being. Meaning there is nothing more exciting to me than knowing, for example, I just, I did uh, 36K on Saturday. I'm still recovering from it. But the thought that I can wake up in the morning and I can fill a pack, fill with uh, gels and sweets and water and I put this pack on and I'm off for 36k um, and it's just me and I'm independently moving through the world and I'm so self-assured in my ability to do so and whether or not it's actually about the run or if it is about just sort of having courage and knowing that I'm brave enough to do something like that, um, if there is no other feeling like it in the world. Like there was quite a painful run towards the end, but when you stop and you know, like I've done it, I did the thing I promised myself I was going to do and my physical fitness is at the point where I can do it. It's the most empowering feeling in the world. And there's now, there's not much you, you could put in front of me that I wouldn't feel brave enough to tackle. A study on the empowering effects of exercise among women found completing a workout was related to the sense of accomplishment and challenging exercises like lifting heavy or distance running are viewed as the most empowering. I mean, this is something that we see every day again and again and again. Building confidence can be achieved through physical fitness and physical endeavours. That's why so many people... I think, love races and love racing and, you know, it's such a beautiful thing and it can, it can just be a walk for some people or a bike ride with your dad or whoever, you know, it's such a, such an empowering thing to do for yourself. So number six is practice, practicing. We've touched on this a lot, but consistency creates results. Practice makes perfect 
repetition is power. I should say actually practice makes imperfect because there is no perfect. It doesn't exist. Um, funnily enough, <laughs> going to get in trouble. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the word perfect recently and, and why this is so... You know, I don't even think, I personally don't think the word perfect should exist in the English language because it's not real. Nothing is perfect. Nothing is perfect. No one is perfect. Um, and I, yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm so sick of the fitness industry at the moment, especially, most especially the online fitness space. Like, I don't know about you guys. You can message me if you feel the same way, but. I just feel like every time I log on to Instagram, I see the same reel or I'm just bombarded by advertisements and I'm just so disenchanted with the whole thing. And it's, they're selling you this idea of perfection constantly, right? Like I'm perfect. I'm perfect. Like this is perfect. And I don't know, I get so tired of it. So, so tired of it. And um, anyway, sorry, I'm digressing there, but practice makes imperfect. That's going to be my new favorite thing to say. The more you practice bravery, the less you'll have to actively think about being brave. Repetition over time can create habits and behaviors that are second nature or done without much thought. And this is something where we all want to get to, right? It's when it becomes automatic and you will get to that space. You know, I think that a lot of people feel like it's always going to feel like you're battling through the woods and you're walking through treacle and it's so hard to do the thing that you promised yourself you're going to do. And you keep flaking, it keeps feeling awful, but after a while it becomes automatic and it becomes, you know, it's just something I do now. And I think that's brilliant, you know anything when it's like a step goal or eating well or being someone who's really um, good at keeping in touch with your mates something I'm trying to work on currently it becomes automatic and I, you have to keep telling yourself because sometimes it's so hard when you're juggling all of the thing you know god I gotta like work on my career keep a skincare routine also be fit also do this also do that it's so overwhelming but I think realizing that the more you do it and the more it embeds yourself into a habit the more automatic it becomes and one day it will just be second nature it'll be something you do without thinking a really good example of this is morning routines right I struggle with my sleep wake cycle because of my mood disorder uh, which means that even though I am a wellness person, I sometimes have to sleep in to like 10 a.m. Because I, if it was up to me, I'd be up at six every day, right? But sometimes I have nightmares. <laughs> uh, this is such a weird conversation, but um, sometimes I just, I have interrupted sleep and I have things that haunt me at night or my brain decides it's going to keep me awake with anxiety or I've had just like a really low time and I'm finding it hard to sleep. I'll always prioritize getting sleep over doing a morning workout. So whatever time it is that I wake up, and I've spoken a little bit about this online, I prefer rituals over routines because rituals are things that I can do at any time in my day, but routines feel really, it feels really trapping, right? Like the morning routine, like up at five, I can't always do that because I just don't have the brain for it. But if we take like my morning routine, ritual now, which is always like supplements, have my coffee, do my journaling, make my to-do list for the day. Always, always. Those those things are the things that I do. Whereas it used to be <laughs> roll out of bed, peel off my false eyelashes, assess the damage of like, oh my God, okay, do I have any bruises? Is anything broken? Is there a takeaway in my bed? Like, you know, um, all of these things. And I think those little rituals that you do, that consistency, practicing that again and again and again will create results. And then it becomes something that's done without much thought. So every morning I wake up, I go, I brush my teeth, I do my skincare, I take my supplements and I don't think about it. It's just something that I do every single day. But it's taken like a good year or so to get to that point. A study from 2019 uh, says that habits may play an important role in how people define their sense of identity and linking newly formed habits to your identity may help you sustain new behaviors. I think we see this a lot in um, the psychology of, of, of online. I, I'm not so keen on the whole like, you know, I'm a wellness girl. I'm a, <laughs> what is it now? It's like mob wife or whatever aesthetic, you know, everyone's jumping on trends. I'm not too keen on it, but I do think there's a big thing to be said for um, linking 
uh, new, new habits to your identity. For example, just the affirmation of I am a runner, I am a healthy individual, I keep my promises to myself, everything I touch turns to gold, you know, these things, linking your habits to them and, and really creating this identity for yourself because, hey, guess what, guys, you can be whoever you want, you are not stuck and you can change it anytime, anytime you want, whenever, tomorrow, today, in the next minute, in the next hour, you get to create your identity. People get so stuck thinking that they're stuck with who they are and the life they have and the fitness they have and the mind that they have when really, you know, we are the alchemists of our future and you can create the person and the identity that you want. And it's okay if people think you're crazy (laughs) and people thought I was mental when I was like, here's the new me and I'm going to do everything in my power to become that person. Um, And then you do it and people are like, wow, Okay, you actually, you followed through. That's really, really, really impressive. Um, But it's, you know, the braver you act, the more you may view yourself as brave, right? You know, it's, it's just again and again, reinforcing, I am a brave person. I'm a courageous person. Number seven, and this is a big one, is accepting responsibility, which is the hardest part. This is the hardest part. And this links in a little bit to the shadow work episode that we did this season. Admitting that you play a role in your own suffering, getting out of the victim mentality and being honest with yourself. That is brave. That's like the bravest. I've thought a lot and I've been reading a little bit about the idea of rumination. I used to have an awful habit of ruminating on everything. I would think and ruminate and go over and go over my suffering, go over my trauma, go over everything bad that had happened to me and all my sad feelings, I would sit and ruminate on them. It's really important to feel what you need to feel and to allow yourself to cry and be sad because when we feel, we heal. But there is something to be said for not ruminating and not being stuck in that part of yourself, accepting responsibility for the things that you know that you're not doing for yourself, for the ways that you're not taking care of yourself. And the hardest one is when you kind of have to come to terms with the fact that I'm making myself suffer. I'm the one doing this to myself. And yes, there are, of course, so many times in life where other people do things to us. Or there are circumstances in which our mental and physical health mean that we aren't able to change at that time. But for the people who know, and deep down you will know that you do play a part in your own suffering, maybe it's time to be honest and try to change. If you find it challenging to step out of your comfort zone, putting yourself in the position of responsibility can help you learn to be brave in a controlled setting. This doesn't mean you should take on a stressful management position at work, for example, but it does mean that you can volunteer to head up a bake sale or host a run club like I'm doing. Whatever it is, something that feels brave, something that gives you responsibility, um, that allows you to feel like you're doing something with purpose. Holding yourself accountable in a group setting is a way of challenging yourself to be brave and take action because others are depending on you. This is such a huge one. No one used to depend on me for anything because I'd always flake. So people wouldn't invite me places. They wouldn't ask me to do things. They would just count me out because I was like, you know, you can't rely on me. And now what I love is that people come to me for help. They come to me for advice and I'll always help them and I'll always give them advice and I'll always be the one that they can depend on because, you know, it feels so good to have people to help and people to inspire. But that encourages you to engage in pro-social motivation, um, which is a really, really good way of building self-esteem, also helping others and guiding others. You know, it, it's such a lovely way of building bravery and confidence and courage. Um, and this could be, you know, everyone in them has a skill and something that is magic about themselves and something that they have a gift to show with the world. For me, obviously, it's it's obvious what I am, but for you, it might be that you're really, really brilliant at, I don't know, 
making cakes or you're brilliant at drawing or you love playing the saxophone or the piano. Is there anything in your life that you can teach others about or you can help guide others through? That's such a big thing. Like I love working with younger people, for example, talking about um, substance problems and mentoring people through exercise therapy and nature therapy. That's I'm it's my favorite part of my life is the mentorship that I do with people who are younger than me. Um, and that makes me feel, I mean, that makes my self-esteem just feel great when we're helping others. That's that. I truly do think that is a big part of the meaning of life is to help and guide others through. And through that self-assuredness of actually I have the knowledge, um, and I have the bravery in this topic to teach others. It helps us feel more courageous so if we're thinking about um, examples of this, this pro, it's basically called pro-social motivation. Um, it's beneficial if you're in charge because it reduces anxiety about being in power and leads to greater leader well-being. Being in charge is, it's such a cool thing. And I think all of us, not all of us want to be leaders and that's okay. I'm not saying everyone has to be the CEO of some massive startup, but having, even if it's just within your friend group, you know, saying, hey, we're going to host a, a games night. I'm really good at playing cards and I'd love to teach you all how to play Go Fish. You know, having that leadership and, and giving others tools is, is a beautiful way of, of building bravery. So number eight, um, a tricky one. And I know we've touched on this before, but surrounding yourself with people you see as brave. Think about the media you are consuming. Um, perhaps there's a few influences that aren't having the best effect on you. Be ruthless with who you follow and who you allow into your circle. Who gets your brain space? Um, make room for inspiring people, join a run club, meet new friends, be brave and put yourself out there. Your tribe will come. Curating the crowd uh, that I run in now, literally, <laughs> changed my life forever. You know, I want to be with dreamers, change makers, people with a get up and go attitude, people who I can tell about my huge dreams and they say, yep, you're capable. And guess what? I'm on board too. I think a lot of us get bogged down by the weight of other people's negative emotions and I think a lot of it comes down to when you are finally brave enough or you do finally build up the courage to say cool today's the day I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do this thing and you tell your mates and they laugh at you you tell your mates and they're like that's stupid or you can't do it or that's so out of your norm and the person that we know you as in your little box that I keep you in that it just seems ridiculous and ludicrous and I'm not going to support you in it and sometimes one of the most powerful things that you can do for yourself is <laughs> removing yourself from those situations for a little bit. I love my mates and I'm really lucky to have kept most of them but there was a time where I had to go a little bit um, on my own. I had to go off on my own um, for a good few months and just be a dreamer on my own, root myself in bravery and courage and work on my goals for myself without the outside chatter of this is ridiculous. What are you doing? You know, what do you mean you're not going to come to the pub? Like there's so many instances where I just needed to be alone on it. And there's this strange period in between when you've decided, you know, you want to be this person and you're not quite that person yet. There's this weird, lonely in-betweenness where <clears throat> you haven't met the people you want to be with and the people that align with your new lifestyle, but you're still hanging on to some of your old ways and your old beliefs. And that part can be really lonely. But I want to tell you that there's nothing wrong with being lonely and there's nothing wrong with solitude. Um, I spend an awful lot of time on my own. And I think what I've learned is that there is great power in that. And there's great bravery as well in saying, I want to do something different to everyone else. And I'm going to have courage and be brave enough to be the one to do it and be the one to say, enough is enough. I'm going to do something different. And you will eventually align with people who feel the same way that you do. Like I've made three really close girlfriends in the end, tail end of last year and the beginning of this year who I never thought I'd meet anyone like that who wanted to do the things that I want to do and go on hikes and go on runs and, 
you know, that's one thing I will say with social media is it, it is a beautiful way to meet like-minded people too. Um, there's a popular adage that goes, show me who your friends are and I'll tell them who you are. It implies that you align your thoughts and behaviours with the people closest to you for good or for ill. If you want to know how to be brave, surrounding yourself with people you view as brave may help through a process known as group positive effect. Group positive effect occurs when the people you spend time with influence your thoughts, emotions, behaviours in a positive way through a shared experience, like collective bravery. So you don't have to do these things alone. You know, a run club is such a really good example of this or whatever hobby you feel like joining, whether it's weightlifting, archery, you know, there are groups that will do it. And collective bravery is a beautiful way of doing something first before you feel like going off and doing it on your own. Number nine, a bit more of a serious one, is speaking with a mental health professional. Sometimes bravery is overshadowed by things that are out of your control. Certain mental health conditions, for example, like anxiety disorders, mood disorders, um, people who are neurodivergent, may directly impact your ability to be brave, despite your best efforts. Speaking with a mental health professional can help you work through underlying challenges that may impair bravery development. So please, guys, if you're listening to this and you're like, okay, Cassie, this all sounds so magical. And I, yes, I want to jump on a horse and run into the sunset with a massive sword and be so brave. But I'm struggling to get out of bed. You know, don't be hard on yourself. Um, if it feels all impossible, sometimes the bravest thing of all is to ask for help. And, you know, I hope in listening to this that you're at least you'll think about what bravery is and what it means to you and how it means something different to all of us. But I think that to be brave is the precursor to all of this. Everything we talk about, it's the first step. And bravery is a feeling, I'm starting to do this thing where I'm trying to uh, physically feel where I feel my emotions. Where is that sadness? Where is that anger? Where is that bravery? And bravery for me is a feeling that tingles in my hands and I feel it in my chest. And I feel it every time I open the door and I go for a run or every time I do something where my brain is telling me I can't. And brave is also saying no sometimes. Brave, like I meant to be running the London Marathon two weeks after Paris and I might say no because I am exhausted <laughs> and that would be better for my mental health. But that is brave because there's a lot of people who want to see me run that, right? But that's quite brave to say no. So yeah, you have got this. I know that you can be brave, even if it feels like you can't in little tiny ways every single day, it will add up. So take courage, dear ones. Um, you have got this. So I'm going to end today. Um, it's not a poem, but it's an excerpt from one of my favorite books, um, which is The Boy, the Horse and the Fox. And it's just a little excerpt. The illustration is just a boy riding a horse into a way into the horizon. What is the bravest thing you've ever said? Asked the boy. Help, said the horse. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate once again that asking for help can be one of the bravest things a human being can do. We are all here on this planet having a collective experience. Being a human being is fucking difficult. You are put up against so much. Trying to work out how to be happy is one of the most exhausting experiences in the world. And actually, happiness or true pure happiness doesn't really exist. Just as perfect doesn't exist, you know. But one of the bravest things you can do is tell someone else, I'm having a really hard time with my human experience and can you help? And people will say yes. And if the first person you ask doesn't say yes, the next person will. Um, and I hope that this podcast can serve as a little bit of help too. So that's my spiel on being brave and finding courage. You have it within you, I promise. Um, yeah. I love you all until next week.